Hello. Come on. Third day. You're almost there. So thank you for having me, for having us. We love talking about what we do, especially 5G. And my name is Juan Cambeiro, and in the last three years, our small team of 5G innovation was responsible for nearly the 90 use cases of 5G we have been developing with customers, which actually was quite we didn't have to think much because this was so customer driven that the use cases were pretty much given by the customers. So something we really learned from all these use cases is that the features of 5G that they value most are yet to come. So we've learned a wealth of information about the use cases they're looking into, the features we should be rolling out to create value-added services for the customers. But it is clear that the most critical services require features that are still to come. And one of them, very popular these days, is, of course, millimeter wave, which around here is the 26 gigahertz band. Sexy, as Brian said before. Lots of gigabits. So as Telefonica, we bought a lot of spectrum. We get a lot of the question of, what for, right? So Telefonica is the only Spanish operator who has uh, obtained one full gigahertz spectrum here in Spain, more than double than the next of the operator in the 26 gigahertz auction. So uh, we get the question of why. And I have to say that we understand at Telefonica that um, millimeter wave is essential to have a solid strategy of 5G in the future, because you need a lot of a spectrum. Not millimeter wave specifically, but you need a lot of spectrum if you want to have a solid future for 5G. It shows our commitment in the leadership and, and solid development of a feature-proof 5G ecosystem. And this means that here in Spain, we'll be the first operator by far to reach speeds of 5 gigabits in the downlink and 1 gigabit in the uplink, which for us, the uplink is pretty much one of the most desired features in 5G and involved in pretty much Every single use case we have, around 90% of the use cases we have, rely heavily on uplink, not on downlink. So why is this band so important? First, the obvious part, bandwidth, of course. We hear a lot of gigabits, but if you have a lot of people, you have to share that capacity. And in the end, 5G is no magic. We have a lot of bandwidth because we can use a lot of a spectrum. If you want to keep that up, you need a lot of a spectrum. So millimeter wave is the answer to that. And then again, uplink. Why I say this? Because we are moving, we're changing paradigm, right? We're coming from a network which is being used by humans. And what we do is consume information. It's pretty much download. But we're moving into an IoT area. Millions of devices connected that generate information that has to be uploaded analyze somewhere, and take decisions in real time, business decisions in real time. So for that, you need a blink. Since mobile networks are really non-symmetrical, they concentrate way more on the downlink than they do on the uplink, you need a lot of a spectrum if you want a significant uplink. Then again, low latency. Many people think that you require a standalone for low latency. That's not true. Low latency comes from the frequency band, when you need, what you need to say for is to get stability on that low latency, right? Slicing. Do you need a slicing for, do you need millimeter wave for slicing? No. Do we believe it is necessary? Yeah. Because if you want to slice the capacity of your network, which means to reserve some capacity of your network to dedicate to specific services, you have to have a lot of available spectrum. Otherwise, if you're saturated, you're not going to do any slicing. So if you want to have a practical slicing, you need millimeter wave as well. And finally, massive connectivity, all right? So what have we been doing in the last three years? This is a, a very demanding use case we had in 2020. It was in a full bus stadium at Riazor in Coruña, which is a town here in Spain in the northwest. So we deploy, as you can see there, we deploy eight, eight cameras. And they were sending video through millimeter wave. What we had is a edge computing center in that very town who received that uh, video. And the artificial intelligence was in charge of tracking the ball. At the beginning, what the software was tracking was pretty much 
the ball head of the referee, but after some tweaking, he was able to track the ball. Once you know where the ball is, you can send instructions to the camera to follow the gameplay and to switch to the right camera to generate the video out to go to the central studio. So in the end, this is automatic TV production without human intervention. It's a low latency loop, as you can see, where you have to have a strong uplink, low latency, and a big capacity with artificial intelligence at the edge. It worked pretty well, actually. It took some time to manage it. As you can see there, you have the heat maps, you have a small points, you have to apply prediction, you see the gameplay, you have an estimation of where the ball is going, so you send in advance instructions to the cameras. I'll go brief because I know I have only 10 minutes. The second use case, we did it with El Corte Inglés, which is one of the main retail companies in Spain. They have a huge logistic hub at the south of Madrid, and they have everything wired, data cables. Why? It's because the classifier machines, they really have to work in low latency. Actually, it's one of the very few softwares that they have to have locally on their local IT network because of latency requirements. What they did is they, they got one of these classifier machines, which is sending parcels here and there, depending on the destination, and they took the cables off, they pulled the cables off, and they put millimeter wave. And actually, we got the record of low latency, the practical record of low latency we have in our projects, which was 1.6 milliseconds on the radio. It was on this project using millimeter wave in 5G NSA. This was a private network. And this was done over the public network uh, in 2021. We have the, the goal open here in Madrid with the European tour. And one of the very many things they do is they have this VIP lounge. They have the complimentary Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, sorry. And usually all that traffic from the Wi-Fi networks, you deliver it through the internet through fiber. So in this case, we connected all this traffic using millimeter wave. It's one of the very few use cases where download was primary in this use case. And we didn't have a single complaint the whole week, so it worked beautifully. And finally, of course, uh, we have the, the coverage of millimeter wave on the whole three over the commercial network, as well in collaboration with Ericsson and Qualcomm. We have two antennas there. You can go there to Qualcomm stand Ericsson stand, actually, I believe they have something as well. In our stand, we have a smartphones and we have a laptop. You can, you can check the speeds we're getting there. So this is pretty much for the most significant uh, use cases we have been doing with millimeter wave. So looking beyond what's we, what's what we think we should be doing, right? The first thing is we believe we should have more focus on the uplink. The telco industry, we have a huge inertia. We're a big industry. So the smartphone manufacturers, the infrastructure manufacturers, the operators, we are very focused on the mass market. But really, the enterprise market and the IoT, they have very different needs, right? One of them is uplink. If you see the priorities they put on the roadmaps, they always start with broadband and downloading speeds. And then second, it goes uplink. So we think if we're going to capture the opportunity of the enterprise market, we have to strengthen the uplink. We believe we need further development on the device ecosystem. Of course, the mass market and the economies of scale, as Qualcomm said this morning in a, in a round table, is, of course, on the smartphones. But if we talk about the enterprise market, we need routers, we need ruggedized devices, we need connected machinery. And for that, we need to develop way more this kind of market. Because in IoT, in industry, you don't use smartphones, really. And finally, we need the stability and reliability. So, which it has to do with the ultra-reliable, low-latency communications, one of the features of 5G is a Saying that we need reliability doesn't mean that current networks are not re reliable. What it means is we need predictability. So to have the occasional one millisecond for industry is not enough. Now I have one millisecond, now I have 12, now five, now 17. Most of the customers, what they say is, I rather prefer you give me 20 by constant. So that in industry is one of the most desired features, to be reliable in the amount of latency or broadband that you can give me. About the development of the devices ecosystem, I'm going to tell you one, one thing that most people don't realize. 
when you talk about crazy latencies, that one millisecond, everything is important. And one of the things that are very important is the device. In that UK from logistics, we could shave four milliseconds just changing the device. So you can be getting too crazy on the radio side, but unless you have good devices, good server, good switches, everything in the middle, you waste a lot of latency right there as well. And one question we get a lot, where are you going to be deploying? What's your strategy? OK, taking into account everything I've been saying in the last minutes, uh, on demand for our enterprise customers are going to be one of the primary focus, right? I mean, industry for the cereal, manufacturing plants, seaport, refineries, logistics like we did. We use cases like going fully wireless. I mean, the thing of having a factory fully mobile with nothing fixed to the ground or to the walls is a big thing, right? If you want to be flexible, cloud robotics, uh, mobile connectivity, all that is really driving a lot of attention. And we're getting a lot of requests in millimeter wave features. So on demand is going to be one of the things we're going to be more active. And of course, hotspots. As it was uh, quite explained before, football stadiums, downtowns, Grand Prix, venues of high concentration. We believe, I mean, who knows what the, this ecosystem is going to look like in a couple of years. But we believe, as of now, these are going to be the, the two most uh, common sense scenarios. And that's pretty much it from my side. I don't know if, if any question is in order or no. OK, so thank you very much.